I was trying to think of thematics and I was trying to think of what was happening in photography at this very period, this time. So photography was developing in all kinds of ways. If one was looking at genres and one was looking at industrial photography, one was looking at commercial photography. Mm -hmm. These are, you know, areas that haven't been looked at. There's been some amount of work on photojournalism because we've had work on Kulban Troy, Humay Biarawala, Kameen Jana. But I don't think the same amount of work has been done on commercial photographers who were working in the glamour industry, for instance. I've been very interested in Jitendra Arya, Dheera Chowda, Bal Kishan, who were photographing for film magazines. Then there's the industrial work of Mitar Bedi, there's Ahmed Ali, who was also doing industrial work. Uh, there were very interesting crossovers as well. And I think that a lot of these photographers were actually not doing just one thing and I think that's interesting. Where somebody like Homai, we know as a press photographer, she was also doing very interesting street photography. We know that she did portraits. We know that um, uh, Nasreen Mohammadi, you know, the minimalist photographer, was also a printmaker. She was also an artist. Also needs to focus on photography as a global form that was traveling, that there were these connections, there were these global encounters, there were people who were traveling across. So somebody like uh, T.S. Satyan in his book talks about how much he was influenced by the family of man. I mean, they were getting exposure to the works of all these different photographers. Before that is that one major exhibition that's held by Marg in 1960, right. which is inspired right. by the family of man, because family of man only has Satyajit Ray, right. you know, a little bit of that right. one photograph from Pothar Panchali. There was a certain amount of travel. So people like Kishore Parikh comes from the University of Southern California, comes back to India, becomes the main person at the Hindustan Times and he's asking for all kinds of changes to be made in photography. He's insisting on bylines, he's insisting on... And the same goes for Jitendra Arya. There are people who are going abroad for training. So somebody like Madan Mehta goes to the Guilford School of uh, Photography, Arts and Crafts, comes back and then, you know, he becomes this important studio photographer, but he's also somebody who straddles the world of um, architecture. There are all kinds of interesting crossovers happening and for me that focus is important because we constantly tend to think of photography as something that was uniquely Indian and I think in trying to articulate this, what is peculiar to a certain kind of a national imaginary, I think that we put ph ph photography into boxes. And my point is that I think that there, was, there were all kinds of interesting influences which were working. I mean, another interesting thing is the fact that magazines were traveling. Even when people couldn't travel, you had photographers who had access to magazines like Life. Like even if it was in the second-hand market, mm -hmm. you had Life, you had Popular Photography, you had Amateur Photography, you had Look, and people were reading those magazines. I think that there are photographers who are continuing with the pictorial tradition and yet they are moving into a kind of a modernist understanding. Even when there are certain kinds of aesthetics that continue, there's a continuity post-independence. It's not like independence comes and suddenly overnight photography changes. It doesn't. There's a large amount of, there's some things that change. Photojournalism becomes more independent, for instance, and therefore it changes. The kind of uh, subjects that they're shooting change. And yet I think that there are some continuities. Pictorialism holds, you know, kind of dominance for a very long time and whether it is in the works of you know people like A.L. Sayyid, Umbala or perhaps in salons and in uh, it's nurtured in salons and in exhibitions. A.L. Sayyid's work there is an obsession with lines and that is not just coming from pictorialism it has to be coming from a certain kind of a modernist understanding. Somebody like Monobina Roy has these entire interesting sequences of photographs taken of her daughter where she's just obsessed with lines, with mm -hmm. shadow, with lines. And that's not coming from pictorialism, that's coming from something else. She's of course very influenced also by her, the fact that her husband is a photographer. Bimal Roy, who's a filmmaker, is also a photographer. But there is an interesting way in which modernist aesthetics and, you know, the lines of modernism and the pictorial is actually kind of crossing over. There are photographers who are now shooting these, who are taking from a completely modernist aesthetic. So whether it is the industrial work of Mitar Bedi, you know, his amazing mm -hmm. photographs mm -hmm. in factories. Ahmed Ali does the same. He, he takes on these commissioned uh, projects. And the third one is Kulban Troy. You look at his photographs of the Bhakra Nangal, which are amazing in terms of, you know, their shadows and their lines. So they're actually using, there's a certain kind of new sensibility that is, uh, that is happening or that is kind of, uh, being being born. Photojournalism, I think for a long time, is actually very influenced by uh, the lasting influence of 
uh, Katya Prasad, mm. the decisive moment. But I think that a lot of the early photojournalistic work and many of these photojournalists then become documentary uh, photographers. They get mm -hmm. tired with photojournalism. So whether it is uh, Raghu Rai who begins his career in the Statesman or Prashant Pandya a few years, uh, maybe a decade later, yeah. there initially I would say that there's a kind of an obsession with kind of a photo ethnography kind of photography. I would say that even Raghu Rai begins like that. There's a kind of a interest in um, travel and they're like these travel logs. So there's a kind of an interest in the small town, the village and of course the city as well. There's an interest in exotic things like the Pushkar, you know, the fair. And yet I think that there are changes happening and the book perhaps allows for that. So I think the photo book marks a certain kind of a turn. The material conditions of photography, practice, what was happening at the level of practice. Paper was a very major kind of a concern for all these photographers because they had to, you know, they, they were publishing in newspapers initially. There's a certain kind of a loss of quality. They're very concerned about reproduction. And I think this whole move to magazine photography actually happens, or calendar photography actually happens because of this obsession with having good reproduction. The only exception, of course, we know was the Illustrated Weekly. And in Calcutta, uh, the junior statesman. The Illustrated Weekly, I think, is probably the only magazine that allows for good reproduction because of photogravier. And mm -hmm. it's there from the very beginning, but that changes too. There is a period in the 60s when there are shortages and for that we have to go back to the context of what was happening in the country. The country is going through an economic crisis, uh, foreign uh, reserves are going down and that affects imports of even newsprint. So what happens as a result of that, of course it's bringing up the costs of uh, photographic material you have. I'm very interested in photographic advertisement and you find all these references actually, this refrain running yeah. through photo ads. In 64, Jitendra Arya photographs the last portrait of Nehru before he died. And it comes out in the Illustrated Weekly, and I've written about it, where he says that the people want it. You know, they, they've got this poster kind of printed in the middle. This is one of Jitendra Arya's kind of a color picture. And they want this, pic this uh, people want to buy copies of the magazine because they want that poster of Nehru. And they print, they say, please send in your requests by a certain date because we, are, have, we have tremendous pressure because of shortage. We cannot print more than so many copies. And so you realize, I mean, sometimes you have to understand these things in an oblique way because there's no direct reference to it. But there are references to the fact that they are running short of paper. So paper becomes a kind of a recurring theme in the accounts of these photographers. And I believe that a lot of this move towards calendar photography and the photo book actually happens as a result of that. So two reasons, not just paper. The other reason is I would imagine that press photographers who begin their career as press photographers, because that's the only way that you can actually show your work, get tired of it. And they want that their work becomes, is, is actually kind of stored for posterity. And the, the best way to do that is in a photo book. So you're moving away towards documentary photography. That happens for Raghu Rai, that happens for Raghu Beer Singh especially. And if I think of the first photo book, I was trying to do a little bit of reading on that. The first one is actually 1972, Kishore Parikh's book on uh, Bangladesh. And it, I think it's almost like self-published because he brings out this book. The next time a photo book comes out is 86, where Dainita brings out her Zakir Hussain book, you know, as a, as a student project. And then by the early 1980s, in any case, Raghubir Singh, who is living across three different, you know, he's not just living in India, he goes from India and then goes to Europe and America. He's traveling and this, you know, comes out with all these series of books, which either focus on fairs or they focus on cities or small towns. It's a kind of a traveler's look, a kind of a travel log like photography, uh, you know, where you bring out these glossy books. And then a decade later, Agurai starts with his books, you know, so move away from photojournalism and actually do this more sustained documentary work and then to produce it in the form of a book because that's the best way it can be seen. And second, the, the obsession with paper, because there's, you know, there's a material reason as to why people move into the photo book. And I believe that the archive of the of mid-century work actually lies in print culture. My own dissertation actually is about that, where mm -hmm. I'm looking at the emergence of glamour photographers through film fair and through film magazines. I'm looking at the tabloid, this 
sensational photography in the tabloid and I'm looking at the emergence of other kinds of work coming out in other magazines like the Illustrated Weekly of India that the Illustrated Weekly almost is this archive where every photographer worth their salt whether it is a photojournalist, a pictorial photographer, amateur photographer is able to publish in the weekly. It gives space to almost everybody. Your amateur photographers, all the women, Monobina yeah. Roy, Debolina Malzumdar, they are actually photographing and publishing their works in the Illustrated Weekly of yeah. India. The magazine gives space to different kinds of photographers. I mean, Raghu Rai, Raghu Beer Singh, they all appear in the Illustrated Weekly of India before they make a name for themselves. The Weekly is this magazine that carries not just, doesn't just allow photographers to be to pu publish their works. So whether it's Humay Garawala, yeah. she starts yeah. her career with the Illustrated Weekly of India, the only professional woman photographer in her time. But it also gives space to studio photography. So they have that page called They Were Married, where you know you have these studio photographs of, people, of couples from all over the country. They do these photo features where they will give you um, the latest scandal in the UK. So the Christine Keeler scandal, you know, those press photographs find their way into the Illustrated Weekly of India. They do these beautiful photo essays which make you kind of travel the world. So you have these photo essays on, you know, the slow train to, through China or you have Uzbek Chaikhana in Moscow or you have Karachi today. It's truly South Asian. And it, it's it, it's not surprising then that the Illustrated Weekly till 1955, even after independence, continues to be uh, circulated in mm. my, what is now known as Myanmar or uh, Ceylon or uh, Pakistan. So when we imagine a time where, you know, this is a period much before globalization, you know, and yet there's so much of movement where people are traveling, exhibitions are traveling, photographers are traveling, collaborations are happening. Jana works with uh, Margaret Burke White. There are all kinds of connections and there is this kind of very vibrant culture of a kind of a flow. The other interesting side to look at is the world of advertising, not just because of commercial photography, but also for the kind of, sometimes when you can't write histories directly because there aren't archives for that yeah. period. I'm talking about mid-century work now. You know, unfortunately, we still don't have a very wide, we're still finding that, that work, you know, mm -hmm. because it, it kind of disappeared. Ram Rahman has actually uh, very cogently put it as a kind of a lost history of photography in a very early essay that he had written. Mm -hmm. In some ways, it keeps coming back to me because it is truly a lost history, which mm -hmm. we need to kind of recover now by, you know, with family collections, finding the, yeah. this work. But for me, the advertisement for Kodak, or for ADFA becomes an interesting way to look at those histories. So I, for instance, am very interested in how Kodak is targeting the family. In each of their advertisements, you have the man taking the photograph of the family, and yet they have the mascot on the side of the Kodak woman wearing a striped sari. She's there in every advertisement, and there has to be a reason. It can't just be that it's the mascot of the woman in the, the girl in the stripes dress mm. becoming a culturally acceptable mm. woman in a striped sari. They're also, in some ways, perhaps appealing or speaking to a hidden constituency of women photographers. And I think that now we have enough to say that there were women photographers who were photographic, perhaps not professionally like Homai, but we have Noni Singh. We have Monobina Roy, we have Debulina Mazumdar, we have uh, Meera Chaudhary, we have Savitri Makhijani, uh, we have Halima Hashim, uh, you know, the work of Malika. So we've got, we've been gradually kind of entering that terrain of finding these hidden photographers. So one is that. The other is Agfa, is actually, uh, both these companies, Kodak and Agfa, are actually giving you tutorials in their uh, advertisements. So you have an entire series in the 60s where Agfa is actually printing the works of A.L. Sayyid and other pictorial, uh, you know, amateur photographers and they're giving you the details. They're like tutorials. They're saying f-stop in the advertisement. They're saying f-stop number, filter, you know, all of that and giving the name of, it's almost like an advertisement for the um, amateur photographer kind of an informal tutorial system. They're bringing out magazines, both Kodak and Agfa are bringing out magazines that are right. distributed either free of cost or for one rupee. Each magazine is yeah. one rupee. In the 80s, there's another mo moment. That's that new lot of documentary photographers, Ketaki, Suni, Dayanita, Ram. Four of them travel abroad and they come back and they are clearly changed by their exposure, you know, because they're coming back and then they're doing documentary photography. They don't become photojournalists they start taking pictures on their own and they create bodies of work. So there's that too.